Um, by the way, I felt a bit ill yesterday, which is why I wasn't on in my original time slot. So I'd like to thank uh, Ryan and Pete Tasker for uh, rescheduling and stepping in to fill my slot yesterday. Um, it was greatly appreciated, chaps. Um, Fairfax Media is one of Australia's largest publishers. They've got mastheads across Australia, including in the three largest cities, Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane. And by late August last year, the team I'm on at Human Made had been working with Fairfax for around about 10 months, which is why I found myself at home on a Sunday night with a glass of wine in hand watching as they relaunched their Brisbane masthead, the Brisbane Times. At 8.08, the site relaunched. Now, neither I nor anyone at Human Made had anything to do with the rendering of this page, but it signalled in the newsroom of Fairfax Media's Brisbane Times they'd started using WordPress as their CMS. And it's that switch to using WordPress as an enterprise-grade CMS that I want to talk about today. Fairfax are replacing a proprietary CMS with one based on open source. It's something the team I'm on at Human Made and the team at Fairfax Media have been collaborating on since October 2016. Additionally, our friends at XWP contributed a feature over the course of a month or two. And the feedback that came back was that it was just another day in the newsroom, which is what we, and when I say we, I mean Fairfax, Human Made and the other suppliers, were wanting to allow our users to get down to what they do best, writing content. Of course, we also wanted that content to be delivered successfully to the readers. Now, today's paper is a technical presentation of the white paper that Human Made released on the project. While the white paper takes a wide view of the features, I'll be looking at some of the code that went behind those features. Now, like it or not, WordPress's reputation could be better in certain circles. So today I hope to show some of the ways that enterprise WordPress ain't what uh, WordPress is typically known as. Fairfax's internal team wanted to reimagine their tech stack. As a digital publisher for over 20 years, a lot's changed since they first went online back in the mid-1990s. In very, very, very simplified terms, the new stack looks like this. WordPress at one end, the website at the other. In the middle, there's databases for the media and content, and they're all connected by the media and content APIs. Additionally, images are served by a provider, so they and the provider's APIs are also in the mix. For the most part, most of the stack was built by the client, and pretty much all that the CMS team had to think about were the three APIs that came out of it. The Content API, the Meteor API, and Cloudinary's API. There are several main features that we've built that I'll be covering today. I'll be covering improving WordPress's publishing and workflow features. We removed the default WordPress publish box and replaced it with what we dubbed the publish box of the future. With both Fairfax's Meteor API and the Cloudinary API in the mix, the built-in media library needed a bit of a facelift, and this includes making different and custom crops um, available each time an image is used in an article. Once you're dealing with thousands of tags, a lot of care needs to ta be taken around importing those. How they are accessed from the dashboard also needs to be carefully considered. This is something that we learned with perhaps more bruises than we would have liked. Before I came down today, I checked out how many work tags work users on their blog, 90. Predictably enough, my personal site is less disciplined with 118. While checking these counts, I also ran this simple query on my local dev server for the Fairfax uh, project. And the number that came back is still a little bit startling. Oh. Yep a little over 23,000 tags, which seems like a lot, but there's a lot of places in the world, and that's before you start thinking about people of note. As the CMS and the site are separate, tags are managed on a central system and published to the Fairfax Tags API endpoint, and the CMS imports these periodically. Now, fortunately, WordPress has some built-in functions for scheduling cron jobs for this purpose. For each of these jobs, we'd get 50 tags from the content API and add them to the WordPress database and repeat this several times until we get 23,000 tags. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We got a 
bit bruised when it came time to import the tags into the database. You see, managing tags makes a lot of very complex database queries. But this isn't, strictly speaking, what bruised us. We knew this going in. And at large scale, you need to consider the database queries. It's simplified, but this is what we have to run each time we insert or update a tag. We insert the tag itself and then set some associated metadata. Before continuing to the code that bruised us, let's run through what happens to the database when you run this code. First of all, WordPress will check if the tag exists via the slug. On the initial import, the slug doesn't exist, so the tag is queried by name, strap in. Checking the tag's name, it then checks the tag's name against the parent again, makes sure that the slug is unique, actually insert the, inserts the tag, let's celebrate this briefly. Checks if the relationship data exists, parent taxonomy, that kind of thing. When inserting tag, it doesn't, so let's keep going. Actually insert the relationship data. Finally, a logic check to ensure a duplicate hasn't been created, and that's just to insert the tag. We have two types of metadata to insert, so we need to run three more queries, twice. And for hierarchical taxonomies, the hierarchy is calculated. WordPress updates what grows to become a very large option every time a tag is inserted. But we knew how heavy on the database inserting tags was, and we were prepared for it. WordPress was to be Roxy Hart to our Billy Flynn, and we were going to make it our puppet. We were going to control for these slow queries by slowing down the import significantly, 50 tags every 10 minutes. The initial import would take some time, a couple of days, but the database would survive. We'd see how it would goes with a few number of tags, a small, a few thousand locally, and decide if we needed to allow for the scaling of cron. However, one morning we woke to discover the world. Or more to the point, the 14,919 points on the globe that had been added to the Fairfax Tags API and that WordPress was importing in turn. This essentially turned all of our environments into this. But slower. <laughs> Fortunately, this was a few months before the site um, before launch, so it didn't affect our just another day in the newsroom goal. What happened was that we needed, needed to immediately rewrite our code and then tidy it up a second time. And even as I was writing these slides, I ended up jotting down notes where there was room for improvement. Using WordPress's built-in cron doesn't use real cron. When a user hits the site, in our case a reporter, her name is Mary Sunshine, WordPress makes an asynchronous loopback request to fake a cron job. This in turn would make an HTTP request to the Fairfax Tags API, and we'd set a cron job to do the actual processing the import later, and then get the next tags from the API. And this worked at first, when there were only a few pages of tags. But once we hit 300, um, 320 pages, which is a lot of pages, the call to WP cron would time out after 30 seconds. What had slipped our mind was that a loopback HTTP request is still an HTTP request. It will still time out after 30 seconds. But in that 30 seconds, we'd already started storing the cron jobs in the database, which is stored as a single option. When the job failed, the same job would um, run and re-add the same data to the database. But while that was happening, the original's job, what it had successfully set up for import, would actually start inserting tags. We reverted the original commit and determined that we did indeed need to allow for the scaling of cron. And for this, we used an existing uh, human-made product called Cavalcade. Cavalcade's a runner because, yes, of course, it's a pun. And the nice thing about Cavalcade is these two lines. By filtering WordPress, it becomes invisible to me as a developer. Developers continue using the same functions, but without the risk of bringing down the server. Okay. Without the risk of bringing down the server again. Although using a proper job runner allows us to change how we use these functions. In production, the code we ended up running didn't look too different from the original code. If anything, it looked less considered. Instead of throttling the imports, we schedule them all to happen immediately, all 320 pages. Well, by the time we deployed this code, all 460 pages. Instead of getting the tags while scheduling the cron jobs, which in retrospect was a mistake to deploy, 
we started storing the arguments needed to make that request. But this wasn't exclusively for the most obvious of reasons. By moving this to the task, we could run multiple HTTP requests to the tags API in parallel. And remember, we've just um, scheduled 460 of these suckers to happen right now. We weren't completely cavalier. We also included some locks to prevent the double scheduling of imports. The cavalcade runner actually runs as a process, which is really nice because it means that um, we get over the 60 second granularity of crontab that would, be, um, would otherwise have been limiting us. In the first iteration, we were slowing down how often these jobs could run. In the current iteration, they can't run often enough. Our new import job runs much as it did before, but because we're using a process runner instead of a loopback HTTP request, we don't have to deal with 30 seconds timeouts. The process runs as long as it needs to run. And these tasks also run on a server dedicated to the process, so they're not going to affect users to the web server. We're now running four jobs in parallel and running the next as soon as the previous job finishes. We were throttling the import to take place over the course of 53 hours. The new code allows us to complete it in around about 30 minutes. When I was going through the database queries, I kind of skipped over the biggest, or at least didn't give it its due attention, and it's the final query that's run, the final query on this page. Updating the term hierarchy option, which is a caching mechanism, and in our case blows out to uh, 335k. To avoid this, we addressed one of the problems, uh, most difficult problems in computer science, cache invalidation. Well, more to the point, we ignored it completely by never adding to the cache in the first place. We suspend updating the cache on the threads running these, um, the import of tags. It also means that we don't have to worry about the four parallel threads uh, with one reading the old th cache while another thread is updating it. It's also quite nice to find a function exists with exactly this niche type of exercise in mind, importing large amounts of data. Enterprise WordPress ain't your typical WordPress. Now, while bringing down the uh, um, servers bringing, um, importing tags was the low point, undoubtedly, we actually managed to get away without too many wholesale reverts which is kind of pleasing considering the project has been running for 16 months. One of the earlier features that we started on was to enhance the WordPress media library. Now, this is the default version from my um, website. Um, there's far fewer photos in the Fairfax library from my holiday to New York to see musicals. And the default media library, to upload an image, I drag it on and drop it. Once an image is uploaded, it's added to the library, um, of course. It's not an uncommon interaction, but it's a really nice one that's all the same, and it's one that Fairfax wanted to keep. What they didn't want to keep was some of the limitations of the WordPress media library. Each library is by default limited to four crops, thumbnail, small, medium, and large. All crops are, glo uh, are applied to all hosts globally. The file names are not systematic. Both images and articles are stored uh, in a share and share a database table. For a typical blog or small media site, these aren't necessarily show-stopping problems. In many ways, simpler is better. These limitations are a feature. However, introducing these limitations to, the Fairfax, uh, to Fairfax fails the just another day in the newsroom test. Switching over to the Fairfax media library, it looks much the same, quite deliberately, and behaves the same. By the way, this is the uh, local development version on my computer. The real uh, Fairfax library has many thousands more photos, and they're not all from the musical Dear Evan Hansen. More's the pity. And while it looks generally the same, there's a lot more happening in the background. Let's start early in the journey. A journalist wants to upload an image to the media library. In this case, they're up uploading a duplicate image. The first thing we do is rename that image to a hash of its own content. Among other things, it allows us to discard duplicates. It also provides the nice systematic file names that we were missing earlier. It's then that some interesting stuff begins to happen. From this diagram, which you would recall at the beginning, instead of storing the images at, um, in WordPress, what we do is we hit the Fairfax built media API and their media team deals with serving of these images to the site. 
the moment a journalist releases their mouse on this screen, we take over from WordPress. At this point, the browser makes a post request to upload the file. And WordPress really, really, really wants to run its own code at this point. There's no convenient, proper function targeting hook that we can use to um, take over. So we take over the entire process right from when it initializes. However, we do feel pretty much follow the same process WordPress follows in duplicate cause functionality. But instead of stopping once we've uploaded the attachment, we in turn upload it to the Fairfax Media API once we've converted the image to the full fact, uh, format required by the me Media API. We make a post uh, to the required endpoint, and this solves the problem earlier of duplicate uh, of image data being stored in the same database as the content. But at this stage, the file has still been added to WordPress. So we rectify this problem by immediately deleting the image from Wo WordPress. We no longer need it. So that's how we've handled uploads. But let's take a look at what happens when a journo wants to insert an image into their article. In particular, what happens when they first open the media library? Standard WordPress will make an AJAX request to query the attachments. And an array of data is uh, returned with information about the attachments as stored in the database. But as you saw when we uploaded the image, we don't have anything in the database. However, the WordPress database, uh, data format for each of these images is quite nice. IDs, the metadata sizing information about the image. It's also nothing like the data that the Fairfax API returns. One of the nice things about systematic URLs is that they're, well, systematic. So the Fairfax API returns only the most basic of information. Now, replacing uh, the entire media library to refer to a third-party API is a pretty heavy touch. Trust me, I know this. But in doing so, we wanted to write as little code as possible. On the server side, there were two functions that we needed to replace for the handling of these AJAX requests, one each for querying multiple and single attachments. In a roundabout fashion, both of these functions, uh, both of these functions wrap a function to convert a Fairfax JSON response to one that WordPress is expecting. Now, WordPress expects the, fun uh, the response to include various sizes, but the Cloudinary URLs are um, dynamically generated. The full size image uses only the image's ID, in our case, the hash of its content. The thumbnails uh, makes use of what we call a name to transform. You can specify the width and height to get a best guess crop, or you can specify completely custom crops. For the default crops to preview these images, we define the sizes in the usual WordPress fashion by registering them in code. This allows us to refer to the default crops throughout the CMS. Each of these lines also causes an image of the specified dimensions to be created on upload. But as you saw, we delete the images moments after they're uploaded. So creating any custom crops can only be described as a waste of time and computing resources. Fortunately, we can disable the generation of these images with one line of code. But that's only half the story. The CMS still needs to know the URLs for our intermediate image sizes. Surely WordPress, that lets you filter everything, has a convenient filter to um, for this right. Everything in WordPress is filterable, and easy to, um, which is what makes it easy to use and easy to abuse. So what we discovered is that when you're getting an attachment, in a roundabout fashion, um, and certainly not directly, WordPress validates the ID as an integer um, as a first step. And in our case, it's an alphanumeric cache of the content and very much not an integer. And in no way is this filterable. At the time, I really would have liked it to have been. It also came just weeks after I'd had a discussion with another developer why I thought the filtering of IDs and attachments in this matter would be problematic. I still think that's true, by the way, but knowing this doesn't necessarily feel our solution, make our solution feel any more elegant. Our solution was to write a bunch of functions with comments along the lines of, this matches the signature of the core function modified for the media API. We wrote them to, as often as possible, match the core signatures to be kind to the developers that came after us, often our future selves. 
I and a lot of WordPress developer types know that core returns attachment metadata is an array of the original images dimensions and the resized images dimensions. For our modified function, we add the URL because it's external and doesn't follow the same rules of URL generation as the native function. By substituting the AJAX responses from our core, um, to build from our core equivalent functions, we could convert the data from the Fairfax Media API to a format expected by the library in WordPress, or at least a representation that we can largely deal with. As far as the client side load, code of the library is concerned though, there's a few problems. The IDs remain an in a string and not an integer. There's something in there called the URL and the size names have been customized. If we look back at the default media library, the one full of my holiday snaps, it's actually made out, uh, the client side code is made up of dozens of views and sub views. The default library has content, individual attachments, that sort of thing. In fact, there are over 42 exposed views in total. All of these views, along with over six models and 19 collections, come from inheriting the client-side tech from WordPress, including the library's WordPress users for the media library, which means underscore, backbone, and some jQuery. But by doing the work on the server side to emulate the output the CMS was expecting, we managed to get away with making minimal changes elsewhere. We got away with overriding a model, the attachment, it's the collection of multiple attachments, six views, and many of these were to customise the template, and we also had to override how the data was queried itself. This last one sounds like a big one, overriding how the data was queried. In reality, it was to ensure that we used our custom attachment model and to ensure that items were ordered ex as expected from newest to oldest. Some of the views were overwritten to change the template used for display, and the original purpose of this template um, change was to display the URL and image names that we'd, use, um, we'd added to the JSON schema. By going heavy replacing the default values on the server side, it allowed us to make the changes to the client side a relatively light touch. We wrote about half a dozen functions on the server to avoid making complex changes to over 42 views, six models, and 19 collections. Or more to the point, it allowed us to focus our client side changes on more difficult elements such as when it came time to replace the default insert selection with something much more useful for inserting an image into an article, which does, start, uh, which does require starting to create some completely um, custom models and completely custom views in which to manage them. We use these views and models to change the URL of the image we are allowing the journal to insert and to allow them to customise the crop. Fortunately, we don't need to worry about saving these changes to the media API as they're modified per article. That was the specific goal, to avoid making image crops globals. The custom crops are inserted into and saved within the article for display. The crop becomes um, part of the article's content. We then WordPress, we store the crop as a short code and send it to the content API as part of our publishing and workflow features. Modifying the publishing and workflow features was one of the biggest changes we made to bump the CMS into something that could be considered enterprise ready. Among other things, we took the default WordPress publish box and replaced it with what we modestly called the publish box of the future, which while lacking in hubris, started as a convenient name while we were building out the UI. It allowed us to distinguish between the one that worked and the one that would work in the future. If you ever find yourself in the position where you need to make anything more than minor changes to the WordPress publish box, may I suggest this is an approach. Kill it. Kill it dead. Like, really, it will just get in the way. We replaced it with our own custom meta box and built it out in JavaScript. One of the goals was just to avoid full page refreshes, which means saving and publishing via the WordPress REST API. This involved customising the default post endpoint to add our custom metadata to it. And each of the custom properties are namespaced, um, FFX, so that we can ensure that we don't clash with any default properties that may be added to the endpoint in the future. We needed to add a custom property for each item of metadata that we'd added to the edit screen. In our case, this was a lot. In fact, it's such a lot that we need to split the screen into two tabs 
one primarily for editors, setting the editorial requirements for an article, and one primarily for the journalist or the reporter writing the story. We ended up adding over 60 custom properties. It can take a little bit of work to keep it just another day in the newsroom. And for each of these properties, we'd have, um, when we were adding them to the endpoint, we included details about the schema. For example, whether it's a string, an integer, an array, or whatever. By registering the property and included the schema, it allowed us to get the required JavaScript models to include our properties for free. To do so, we needed to extend the libraries we inherited from WordPress to include the WordPress REST API's backbone client library. Yay, more backbone. But it's complex. But by correctly defining the schema, including it in the client library, we have instant access to our properties in the post model. And this also, um, and this automatically generated model is also aware of validation rules. This can give us a head start for client-side validation, while full validation is automatic on the server. As part of adding these custom properties to the edit screen, we needed revisions to include a bunch of additional content stored as metadata. For this, we used Adam Silverstein's uh, post meta revisions plugin which was working while we were saving with the default WordPress publish box. Once we switched to the publish box of the future, we started experiencing an off by one error when saving revisions. Updates to custom properties would be stored against the following revision. A full page refresh via the standard publish, uh, bu via WordPress's standard publish box uses WP insert post to update the post content, the taxonomies and the metadata. At the end of WP insert post, a new revision is generated. Saving via the REST API does things differently. It uses WP insert post only to save the post content, the data that's in the post table. Taxonomy and metadata updates ha happen separately. So this changes the order in which things happen. By default, revisions are created before the post data has finished updating. If revisions don't include metadata, this isn't a problem. Once revisions include over 60 custom properties, the client begins to notice. To manage this, on REST API requests, we remove the revision callback from running at the end of WP insert post and instead generate the revision at the end of the, w, uh, at the, end of the REST API request. We then restore the revision generation to WP insert post once we're finished because this allows for REST requests that don't happen on their own thread. Regardless of how the data is saved, once the journalist clicks save, the data needs to be sent to the content API. Unlike media and attachments, we maintain a copy of the content in the WordPress database. For the Brisbane Times, once an article was published, we'd store revisions in WordPress and only send it updates to the published content to the API. There's a ticket to send drafts to the content API too. That there's a content API it may have you asking, why WordPress? We're still very much deep in the weeds of WordPress and we get a lot for free for using it. For example, one of the things we get for free are short codes. Although we change the for data format for the API to use a placeholder ID in the content and include the WordPress shortcode properties separately. Other freebies include getting a nice editor, cases for limiting permitted HTML, um, uh, which is actually, and permitted HTML is really cut back for this project, lists, block quotes, links, and basic formatting only. So I've just spent a good chunk of time talking about the code we wrote on this project. On the human-made side, this is who we are. We built the project with the core CMS team from Fairfax. Ben, Arpita, Luca, Chris, Dim, and Udit. And as I mentioned, our friends at XWP contributed a feature too. When I talk about us and we, that encompasses a lot of people. In total, there were 31 people with non-merge commits on this project. About two-thirds of these people at one time or another were doing full-time dedicated work just on the CMS. Between us, we made around 11,500 commits and counting. Once the last person at Human Made wraps up, the internal Fairfax CMS team will continue building this system. This number will only grow. For most of these commits, my job was code review. It got to the point that introducing myself, on more than one occasion I've made the joke 
that my job is code review and fooling myself that I really will one day get to pick up a ticket. As the team grew, I'd spend 40 hours a week reviewing code. I didn't write this code. The team did. And when you take merge, in, merge commits into account, about 3% of total commits are just me clicking the merge button on a PR after it's been approved. It's very easy, though, to think of code review as unproductive time. The biggest lesson I learned working on this project was that code review is productivity. And that's my guilty secret. I enjoy code review. But I also think code review is a good part of what makes a project enterprise grade rather than anything else. Well, perhaps to put it a little bit better, as the time and the team size grows, spending extra time on code review is an affordance that's no longer considered a luxury, but becomes part of the process to build a stable product. So when earlier this month, the Age launched on the uh, new stack, signaling that the Melbourne newsroom was using WordPress as their primary CMS. The fact it was safe to do so had nothing to do with the code base per se, but everything to do with the processes around building that code base. And that's what makes what we did an enterprise project. Thank you very much. All right, we got time for one or two questions for Peter. Anybody have any questions? All right. Was there a particular reason why you uh, picked Cloudinary for your uh, image handler? Are there pros uh, and cons to that? Uh, that was a decision made by the client to go with Cloudinary. Uh, I'm not sure uh, what their reasoning was, but I believe I looked into a few providers and decided to go with Cloudinary in the end. Anybody else? All right, thank you, Peter. Thank you.